This is GSDA Based Systems 1, Module 10 Lecture, and I'm your instructor, Robert Hewlett. Some of the topics for today are AJAX, Express and Jade, and Sending JSON, PostGIS, Components, Raster, Vector, some of its capabilities, uh, JSON um, in PostGIS and PostgreSQL, and the TERF JavaScript library. So some of the some of the learning outcomes are to describe uh, AJAX itself, create AJAX callbacks, describe methods of responding to an AJAX call, describe the components of PostGIS, describe the capabilities of PostGIS, uh, specifically uh, where it relates to the lab, describe and distinguish uh, the TERF JavaScript library, and list some of the core features of the TERF library. We're also going to talk about how to spatially enable a database, uh, a table, some of the key metadata views that are in PostGIS, uh, compare and contrast different versions of PostGIS and where I believe you should want to be, uh, list and distinguish some of the key SRIDs that you can run into, especially when working with data in BC and Canada, and list and distinguish some of the key logical spatial data structures supported by PostGIS. Um, also, uh, let's distinguish some of the spatial data formats that you can get in and out of PostGIS, uh, well-known text, GeoJSON, those types of things, uh, some of the key geometry types, also some of the key geometry functions, and uh, the related spatial extensions. So there's much more to PostGIS that has a lot of friends, actually, in the database. These are some great resources. Definitely uh, check out the Boundless Workshop on PostGIS Intro uh, and that and spatialreference.org or epsg.io for the SRIDs. All great sites. So we're going to talk about AJAX. What is AJAX? And what is AJAX all about? So AJAX is asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which is weird because we've been talking about JSON. Um, however, there's not a lot of XML happening today. That might be a little bit a little bit of a white lie, uh, but if we're talking modern day JS web services, then there's a lot more JSON and GeoJSON happening, or people desire that there be a lot more JSON and GeoJSON happening uh, versus uh, XML. Or you just send raw HTML to be swapped out in a div, right? So you could your your AJAX call could send back not XML but just HTML that needs to be swapped out. So what is a that's what AJAX is that ability to use JavaScript to uh, get data. But what's that all about? And so really, what it's about is about not refreshing your page, which may sound really weird. We're breaking your page up into little pieces. And that's what I talked about in early lectures about the div, the div allowing you to do that. And then as only as certain parts of that page change that they get updated. And that's done asynchronous, asynchronously, which means you don't have to do a full page refresh. A lot of the page stays the same and only certain parts update. Um, you can be busy working in other areas of the page while another one's updating. And it doesn't affect you getting stuff done. And so there's a big thing about not reloading that whole page. And so there's probably two core components to doing AJAX type things. One is where you make an XML HT, HTTP request, regardless of if that's actually going to bring back XML. That's just when they wrote it, that's what was happening at the time. We'll send GeoJSON, or actually JSON back uh, via that request and then a function that handles it. So one is the request that you send in and then uh, you also send in an unlit firecracker a callback function so that when they're done uh, processing the result they can send it back to you via this function. So this is just a little uh, graphic stolen from W3 Schools and it's all about uh, if we start up where the browser is. The browser creates this XML HTTP request object and then eventually it sends it. Now sending it doesn't cause your page to change. That goes over to the internet, the server gets the request and then it responds to it and sends data back. Now when they first originally wrote this 
what was being sent back was XML, typically out of what we call SOAP XML Web Services. And this is where all the OGC web services sort of fit. All their web mapping services, web tile mapping services, web feature service, web feature service transact, web coverage processing services, uh, and that as well. And so, or they're just their geoprocessing services. So all of their services are spec'd out as SOAP XML. And so those services do send back XML and in the JS world, GML would be the big thing coming back. But we can also send back JSON if we choose. And if we're doing JS stuff, we can send back GeoJSON. And so we get that request and it might take us some time. And some time might be, you know, milliseconds or a couple of seconds, but we don't tie the browser up. When we finally get uh, it together, figure out what needs to be sent back, then we can send back all that data to the browser. And there's usually, uh, on the, when we send it back, is there's usually a, uh, a, in this case, a JavaScript function that will handle the data coming back and update part of the page, not the whole page. And like I said, the div is usually that, that element in HTML that makes it really easy to swap out a chunk of the page or just update the tiles in the map. Uh, in map viewer to say if we're using open layers. So the browser forms a request. It also has a function that'll handle the server calling back that eventually gets shot across the internet to the server. The server does what it has to do, talks to a database, talks to a web service, gets the data together, sends the data back. And when the data gets sent back to the browser, the, fu the callback function is the one that handles the processing of that data um, uh, within the browser, tip it, written in JavaScript, and typically updates a part, not the whole, a part of the page. So in here, uh, it's a little code example of me making an XML request. So I go var, I give it a name, make a new request. I open the request, and then I you see the word post there. So I'm sending a uh, a method right so we saw post get connect we saw those uh, that big list of methods in previous lectures and uh, I also uh, send I guess uh, the route so post would be the method map would be the route so if I had uh, in a node.js application if even in my index.js file I had a router dot post and in the single quotes instead of the forward slash being the root I had the word map that means if someone went to my website localhost colon 3000 forward slash map that's the route right but I send back like I was doing a form a post and true just means is this asynchronous because you could say false and, and, and make it wait but why <laughs> right but you do have that ability now you send if if it's going to be a form like request and usually what does that mean um, what it means is you're going to be sending some variables over and uh, and that just like I would be filling out a form the idea here is that when someone fills out a form and you go submit that's usually a page refresh so we can kind of mimic or fake a form being filled out by one having a route and a method sending this uh, request header that the content type is an application form uh, URL encoded so we're going to be sending it over and then uh, we need to set up the callback and so this next line where we go map HTTP on ready state change is that and again it's one of those on ones so that's an event so we've seen this before with PG it's a different way of setting it but it's on row on end on error this is on the state changing on the server it's going to call us back on a function, right? And typically, uh, if the ready state is four, that means it was good. Something didn't blow up. Then we're going to go into the document, find find a, uh, an element uh, called map, typically a div, and swap out its inner HTML to whatever came back on the response. But this function in blue, right, is uh, is technically an unlit firecracker, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and although this is written in what I call the uh, inner function style, we could flatten this out. And we'll flatten this out in the lab to make it a little bit more readable. But this is how they're going to look when you are uh, 
looking at samples on the web. But the big thing is you make the X, XML request. If you go back to the top, you have to open it. You're going to give it a method and a route, which works really well with Node because it understands routes and methods. You got to kind of say, hey, we're going to kind of act like a form here. And then that gives you the ability on the back end to pull out variable names if they're sent over. And then we hook up uh, the the event. So on the event state changing process, you know, basically your request came in and there's a response coming back. So the state's changed. Four usually means it's a good thing, and not an error, like a 404 or a 500 error. And we're in in this function, we're just going to swap out the inner HTML of a particular element, probably a div called map with the response text coming back from the request. So how is this going to look in Node? Right? So Node and Ajax, right? So one th if if we think of Node being the back end, once it after it gets the Ajax call, what do you want to send back? Right? You could send back a whole page, right? This would be weird because we're doing Ajax and it's usually a partial update to the page, but we could, right? It'd just be request.render some jade view and then a whole page would come back. And so uh, that's one option uh, in that. Or we send part of a page back. So maybe our jade view doesn't inherit from layout. It just sends a chunk of HTML that gets swapped uh, where we put it inside a div or something. So say our jade view took the rows from the database and turned it into an HTML table. So we don't have, the concept is we don't have the HT doc, we don't have the head and title, we don't have the body tag. All We start right at the table tag. And so what it is is the page already has all that stuff. It already already got all the HT doc, header, metadata, links in the scripts. And we just want to go down to a div and inside that div inject uh, you know, opening tag table and then a bunch of uh, rows and columns, closing tag table. So we can send back partial HTML, right? And so uh, we can still use uh, Jade and everything that's set up in there. So it would still be like uh, response.render some Jade view and we can still use that uh, uh, JSON ability to sub in variables. We just don't send an entire page. And so typically your Jade view will not extend the layout. It'll just not have any sort of header or footer information. It'll just be a little HTML fragment, right? Enough to describe the opening table, closing table, and all the rows and uh, TD tags and TH tags within it. So that's one thing you do. You can send a whole page back, part of a page back, right? Or J to send JSON back, right? Don't send HTML at all. Just shoot a JSON object right back at the browser. Because browsers, they get it. And they know how to handle it. And so what you have to do is in your Jade view, right, all you have typically is exclamation point, curly brace, curly brace. And inside the curly braces, you have your JSON object. So if we look at the more specific object, so we have the exclamation point, curly brace, and then we'll have key value pair the object colon and then some JSON object dot stringify okay and then in a, cur a closing curly brace and we send that uh, back uh, to the browser so we don't send a p HTML page we don't send HTML at all we just send raw JSON back to the browser and it'll parse it and deal with it there Right. So one thing is the syntax that we saw before in a jade view when it was substituting variables, we saw this pound sign curly brace. So we don't do that because what happens is jade thinks you're sending HTML and HTML has angle brackets and, and, and so it starts messing with your quotes and then it doesn't, you don't get a properly formatted JSON object on the other side. So that's what the not symbol means. It, basically the not symbol, little exclamation point, don't mess with this. Okay, and so and that's the, the and that's the issue is that Jade assumes if you don't tell it so that what you're sending back is HTML. So we just put the not symbol, everything between these braces, just leave it alone and just send it raw text uh, back to that uh, back to the browser. I'm going to switch gears here and just talk about PostGIS, right? And so because this we are spatial, so let's talk about it. Uh, and then we'll 
swing back and talk about JSON and GeoJSON. So, uh, where do you want to be, right? And so, I believe you want to be uh, nine and higher on the database. So today you can go get nine four. You'll be able to get nine five really soon. And you want to be at least two and up on the on um, PostGIS extension. Why? Well, uh, I kind of led into that because it is an extension. Um, before the two version, you had to run a bunch of SQLs. There's a whole bunch of things uh, that happen when they move to this extension concept that Postgres SQL the database supports. The extension automates a lot of the admin work. Before when I loaded a layer, I would have to go to the metadata, metadata tables and update the fact that I loaded the layer. Now, as I add layers with FME or make them with PG Modeler or some other tool, the metadata views automatic, automatically get uploaded. If I drop a table, they automatically get scrubbed. So that's a heck of a lot of admin work you do not have to do anymore. And so that's why I always recommend you got to be 9 and higher in 2. And there's a lot of new stuff and so as soon as uh, 9.5 drops and they'll drop a new version of PostGIS 2 after that, I think they're on 2.2.1 now, uh, that's when I'll be updating databases to to do that because there's a lot of new functionality that we want to explore. Now if we go to PostGIS on Gamma and you can type this query in, select PostGIS full version and these numbers can change if we've ran an update recently. But basically you're running 2.1.4 on PostGIS um, but PostGIS just isn't one thing. PostGIS is the part that knows how to store spatial data and work with the Postgres SQL database. Geos is a library that is a C++ port of GeoTools, which was formerly called the Java Topology Suite. That is where PostGIS gets its ability to buffer uh, spatial objects, to do intersects and unions and calculate the distance between objects. So that is a very well-known uh, GeoTools, a very well-known Java library that has already worked out all the algorithms and logic about that. And Geos is a C++ port of that. Now, so that's all about analysis, right? Uh, typical classical GIS operations. Now, projections is handled by the Proj4 library. And we're using 4.8. Uh, and uh, Proj changes, the major change was around version 4 uh, and that. Um, and, but that's all your SRIDs and the ability to transform from one projection to the other or the ability to work with geographic data in a proper circular arc uh, measuring distances on a spheroid or sphere type of scenario. And so, again, PostGIS is just not one thing. It, it relies heavily on these other open source libraries to do a lot of the hef, heavy lifting in terms of analysis and transformation. GDEL, very well known uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, geographic data abstraction layer library. And it is very well known for raster. And the big thing is how do you get a bunch of raster data data inside Postgres quickly. Well, GDL knows how to convert TIFF and JPEGs and Mr. Sid and ER Mapper format and I think it's called ECW and all these different raster formats it knows how to manipulate and turn into SQL scripts that you can load into PostGIS. It also has some pretty interesting raster uh, analysis and query capabilities too. There's also something called OGR in GDAL that can help you read in ARC info coverages and map info files and I think a little bit of DGN and DXF so it can also be used to convert some vector formats too. Now to convert PostGIS geometry done by PostGIS into GML, SVG, KML we use the libxml library. To turn it uh, PostGIS geometry into GeoJSON then we use the libjson library and raster is an extension that got dropped into PostGIS because PostGIS was originally vector so point lines and polygons also did uh, topology as vectors but the raster allows it to manipulate rasters and they've done it in a way that when you call a PostGIS like SD function underscore buffer it doesn't matter if the table is in geometry geography or raster it'll just buffer it 
And so they've done a lot of work to try to make that seamless. So whether your data is fundamentally stored as vectors or raster, uh, you should be able to use all of the PostGIS functions against it. So, so those are just some of the components of PostGIS. It's just not one thing. Now, if you're using the extension version 2 and up, and we are on Gamma, then you get a table and a whole bunch of views. So one table you get in your public schema, and you can go look at it because all of your databases have been spatially enabled, is the spatial reference system table. And it's a table that holds all the SRIDs and the well-known text that describes that projection. And that's in the spatial ref systems table, and it's a table. There are a bunch of views, so there's a view that tracks all the tables across your database throughout all your schemas that have a geometry column. So as you add data and drop data, this view is updated. Now if you choose to use geography and do you know, uh, the great arc distance calculations or circular, dis uh, circular arc calculations, so distances on the spheroid between two lat longs, and you don't want to do it in planar, you actually want to know what that is. Um, then any tables with columns defined as geography will show up in the geography columns view. If you choose to load rasters in using GDAL and get them into the database, then they'll be tracked in the raster columns table. If you build pyramids, reduced ra re resolution rasters off of those original raster tables, so for quick zooming, uh, pan you know, zooming in and out, uh, we can hit different pyramid levels, uh, then uh, those are kept, uh, we keep track of those in the raster overviews uh, view. And so in your public schema, if you expand that and go down beyond tables, you will see a little view part in the hierarchy. You'll probably see four or five views in there, and you can expand that and take a look at those as well. So because we uh, we use SRIDs a lot. When we're working today with open layers and leaflet and QGIS and even ArcGIS, uh, a lot of times we don't type in Mel Bell Bears, right? We type in a number. If we make a model with PG Modeler and we add a geometry type and we set the SRID, we don't type in uh, Canada Atlas Lambert. We do not type that in. We are only can type in the number. So more and more the products that we work with only, you know, the the one consistent thing is the number. You can go into ArcMap to find a new file geodatabase to find a new feature class and when you go to set the projection if you type these numbers in they will work. Just like they work in open layers and leaflet and PostGIS uh, and PG Modeler. And so it's very important for GS people who are working around databases, and I think GS people in general, to understand uh, what these SRIDs are. And if you're having an issue of, of not being able to zoom a map in open layers, it's usually around that your map, your layers are not in the SRID that, that you think that they are in. And so 43, uh, 4326 is the standard WGS84. If you get a lat long off a phone, off a tablet, off a GPS unit, Today, typically, that is the SRID that it is coming from. And to get that to land properly on the map, you have to let the map know that that's where that long, that long is coming from. You could get into a uh, 4267 situation, which is NAD27. There's still data out there, <clears throat> right? Because it is a big assumption that if you get a lat long, that it's 4326. So you should. I mean, always ask the question at least, are you sure that's WGS84? Now, if you're dealing with data from the BC government, or you're dealing with any of their map services, or if you download data from the GOBC site and load it in the PostGIS, it's going to be in 3005, Mel Bell Bears. Again, we've had people get data from Ontario, 3161. Uh, Alberta, just next door, what they've done is they've taken a UTM zone and made it really wide and so that they can have all of Alberta in one UTM zone and it's called it's called the 10 TM it's their wide zone and um, it's basically 3401 so I've, we ran into this data so we have some township grid data in our database in this format if you go to GeoGratis which is a federal site all the NTS data 
A lot of their web services, geo-based and that, are in 3978, Canada Atlas Lambert. So it's a nice projection that kind of centered in Canada and that you can display all of the uh, national data that way. Now if you're working with web services, Bing, Google, uh, OpenStreetMap, and you're working with Open Layers and Leaflet, their default go-to projection is 3857. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. It's Spherical Mercator, what some people call Web Mercator. And it also, some people don't uh, realize that, also comes with a built-in 1 through 28 zoom level. And those tiles are pretty well fixed for every level, 1 through 28 for the whole globe. So, you know, if you're on zoom level 8, in a certain part of the world, you'll be on the same tile in Bing, in Google, and in OpenStreetMap. So it's kind of like a universal grid. It's not the best grid. There's lots of people like, no, no, bad grid, bad grid, don't use it. But it's uh, kind of too late um, on that. And and so Web Mercator, you're going to run into it because it's Open Layers default, it's Leaflet's default, it's Google Maps default, it's Bing's default. And so a lot of people. Uh, understand that or assume that's the projection you are in. Also, but I'll say it again, it's not just the spherical web Mercator projection, it's also this 1 through 28 zoom level that you, as a JavaScript web mapping client person, which you are now, you have to be aware of. Uh, these are all the, what follows are all the UTM zones in BC. So, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And if you're, we're talking about BCIT, if we're talking about a lot of the more lower mainland, Surrey, Burnaby, uh, and that, uh, a lot of the GVRD is in UTM zone 10, 26910. So you just gotta remember 269, and then it's 07 for zone 7, 08 for zone 8, 10, 10 for zone 10, and uh, 11 for uh, zone 11. But these are some common ones that you're definitely going to run into uh, a majority of these just dealing with BC data, right? And then if we go to our neighbors or get data off the feds, we're going to bump into the other numbers. What I want to talk about now is PostGIS IO, input output, right? So PostGIS supports many data formats uh, for end users. So there's what that means is there's a lot of way to a lot of ways to get data into the product. So PostGIS has its own internal storage format. It's an open source database. It has JDBC drivers, so it's no secret. They're just like just use it. So if you're in using Java and JDBC to connect to the database, and you go get object on the geometry column, then you're going to get a PostGIS native uh, form object coming back. Now. Uh, and so that you know, it's documented. You can work with it. Uh, another, other, other more international standard ways would be SQL MM, M for multimedia. And so you can get it back as text. And under that, you can get it back as well-known text. And that's been specified by the OGC. Well-known text extended uh, because of all things, they actually didn't specify the system reference ID in the well-known text spec. They were too focused just on the geometry trying to get people to agree that a point is real <laughs> and how to describe a point and a line is real, a line string actually and a polygon and polygons can have holes and those sorts of things. So that focus on just the geometry, they missed the system reference ID. So well-known text extended is something that PostGIS has done to allow for the important fact that the geometry is not enough. You need to know the system reference ID for that. Other text formats, GML from OGC Web Services, Scalable Vector Graphics, and GeoJSON is text as well too. So we can deal with that uh, in PostGIS. If, you want bi if you're dealing with binary data, they do have a uh, utility for converting ESRI shapefiles into SQL files that you can then run to load data into database. Of course, we can deal with any format that FME can convert if you have that software from Safe Software. It's just another way to get binary data into the database. You can also deal with OGC well-known binary, so it's a binary specification for uh, for geometry, very and it follows well-known text, but just in binary format. And of course, PostGIS extended 
well-known binary to handle the ESSER ID because it is also missing the system reference ID. Now o the OGC geometry that POST just supports is they support all those types. The concept of a point, line string, polygon, and those polygons can have holes, and then multi-versions of that, multi-point, multi-line string, multi-polygons, and that. Z versions of everything above, M versions of everything above, ZM versions of everything above. And we can have a, a geometry collection of well, which would be a mixed bag of any of those geometry types. And they have added SRID support on all of those. And we've seen even in PG Modeler the geometry constructor where we have what point do you what type geometry type do you want point multi point and then an SRID three zero zero five or something like that. So how do you spatially enable a database? First you have to make sure that PostGIS itself is installed. So if you're on a Red Hat box, we're talking make sure you yum in that package. Or if you're on Debian or Ubuntu uh, make sure you use apt-get to get it in. If you're on a Windows machine, you'll probably be using Stack Builder from Enterprise DB. So make sure the software is installed first. And then you use a tool like pgmin3, typically, or you can do it with SQL. Uh, you get in there, expand the database cluster, get to your database, right-click on the extensions branch of the database, and go New Extension. And then usually in the drop-down list, you select PostGIS, and you go OK, and you're spatially enabled. And there's a lot more extensions in there like for geocoding and routing as well. And so we'll talk about the, that. What if you want to do a old school sort of arc node topology? Well, they have a topology type as well. There's also a topo JSON out there, just so you know. Tiger for geocoding, point cloud for LIDAR and last data. They also have a point cloud to PostGIS go between. So how you can quickly turn some LiDAR points into PostGIS points and expose it to all the rich functionality of buffering and that sort of thing. And of course there's PG Routing, it's another extension. So if you need to do network allocation location, then PG Routing can help you do that. But these are extra spatial extensions that you can add. So to spatially enable a table, we can just go uh, uh, create table. Here I can go modtem.demo, shape geometry, but that would create generic geometry. And I've done FME videos where I say uncheck that box because this causes problems. So the second sample is always a little bit better where you go create table, some schema, some name, uh, a column called shape of type geometry, but you say what the geometry type is, point, line string, polygon, multipoint, that sort of thing. And an SRID, 3005. If you do it that way, I mean, you can be uh, heads up digitizing in no time and collecting data into the database. What if your table already exists? Well, you can just alter the table and add a column on. Again, you can go generic geometry, which I don't advise, and alter table, uh, uh, add shape geometry point 3005. So I do recommend specifying the geometry type and the SRID, a lot less headaches later. Now there's not a nice way, I don't think PGMIN3 um, that they've updated, they give you the ability to set the geometry type. So you have to do it through SQL or use PG Modeler. So we're we'll talking about putting and fetching, so how do you put data into the database? Well, lots of ways, right? So we can go geom from text, that text would have to be well-known text, we can do extended well-known text, we can go well-known binary, extended well-known binary, GML, GeoJSON, KML. So that's all putting in, we can get it all back. Okay, and so STS text defaults to well-known text, as well-known text extended will get you the SRID, as binary will default to all well-known binary, uh, and well-known binary extended. Now, th why do they have these names? That's because the standard put out by TC211 and OGC said the functions have to be this name. So it's not that Post just wants them to be these names because you see the ones above are very descriptive and these other ones are like leg legacy ones but once they're in the spec they're in the spec they're hard to get out. We can also get it as GML so it'll convert the PostGIS geometry to a GML version, a GeoJSON version, a KML version, a scalable vector graphics version. So there's a lot of like uh, you know tiny parts of what people might think only are only exist in FME actually are built right into the database for flipping these um, 
formats because you end users wanted them so they coded them and I got to add it to the uh, extension so we do have specific geometry functions so if you don't want to go geometry you want to make sure that it's point uh, what this really helps with data entry and throwing errors if someone if you only want points and someone sends you a polygon it'll throw if no if you throw an error because if we use generic geometry we can get ourselves in trouble so these are all here if you need to convert a specific type of geometry in that and they all can take an S or ID thank goodness so what, once you get geometry in the database what can you do with it well we can inspect it and so I can go to a point and say hey give me your X give me your Y I can go to a line string and say how long are you and that'll be based in the SRID coordinate system. I can get the to and from nodes, the endpoints, the start points. I can say, hey, I need the eighth vertice uh, in the line string. I can do that. I can ask, how many vertices do you have? For polygon polygons, I can get the area. I can get interior and exterior rings. I can ask, what are the total number of rings? For geometry collection, I can say, how many geometries are in there? And I can say, can you go get me the fifth geometry in the list? Things like that. Uh, you can also create new geometries from old geometries. We can do envelope calculations, we can buffer points, convex hulls, uh, the difference between two shapes like an erase, unions and intersections and symmetrical differences and getting the bounding box again or the 3D extent. There's lots of ways to create new geometry off of old. We can test for predicates. Do, are these shapes far apart? Disjoint. Are they exactly the same shape? Do they intersect? Do they cross? Do they overlap? Do they touch? Does, is one does one uh, cover the other? Is one covered by the other? Is one completely within or does one completely contain the other one? Are they within a distance? Right? Now actually SD distance will tell you what the distance is. SD underscore D within will just return true or false about are they within 300 meters of each other? Yes or no? Uh, and we can also expand simple geometry into complex geometry. I mean complex into simple. Also, a PostGIS has a little bit of JSON and GeoJSON, right? And so just to review that, curly brace means you're an object, which will have a v key value pair separated by a colon. Square brackets means you're an array, which means you'll have values separated by a comma. And this, uh, the example down below would be the very first one where it's square bracket, bunch, uh, uh, square bracket brace. That means this is an array of objects. And down below where it goes, Brace, rows, uh, this means you're an object, you have a property called rows or a key called rows, and you are an array, right? So that's how you sort of read uh, geo, uh, JSON. Now, Postgres, the database, has a bunch of uh, JSON built in, so Post just didn't change that. They can convert a row to JSON, they can convert an array to JSON, they uh, and that they can also uh, look at a piece of JSON and tell you how many things are in the array, and they can cycle like a for loop for each thing in the JSON object do something, okay? And they can extract all the key names from a particular JSON object. Uh, there's also a way to bring uh, the JSON back as an aggregate. Because if we just convert a row to JSON, then we'll get a bunch of rows. Uh, and sometimes what we need is those rows assembled into a JSON array and to send that back. Subtle difference, but we don't want to send a bunch of text strings back. We want to send one big text string back that describes the JSON object. Uh, specifically added by PostGIS would be the GeoJSON uh, capabilities. So to convert, GeoJSON into Postgres's native format of geometry or to report its native geometry as GeoJSON or as TopoJSON uh, as well. So here's an example of uh, GeoJSON, uh, right? Uh, typically you have, uh, so it starts off with a brace, so we're dealing with an object. The first key is what type are you? I'm a feature collection. And the next property are the features of the feature collection, which will be an array. And uh, inside there, inside the array, right now I've got, I guess, one thing. What type is it? It is of type feature. What's your geometry? Well, we go look at it. And the geometry has a type of point and has another property called coordinates, which are organized into an array for to separate the x, y values. And then there's, after that, 
are the properties which we would think of as like column values and it has one property called property zero value zero all organized in key value pairs okay. and you can check out the GeoJSON site and actually have some fun there and watch it as you heads up digitize objects it'll convert them into the GeoJSON equivalent what I want to talk about now is turf in that and it is a library for doing a little bit of spatial analysis right so they, they tout themselves as, as advanced geospatial analysis for browsers and node not so sure there but it's okay uh, uh, but because it says browsers and nodes that means you can do this analysis in the front or the back end it's really up to you how you want to do it right but I would say if you have if you're in the back end and you have post just let it do the analysis it's very fast at it it can fast and scale much more so uh, the native format that turf deals with is GeoJSON right so we're seeing GeoJSON pop up more and more they have over 51 modules that deal with geometry and spatial joints and measurements and transformation but just you know and their transformation isn't projection it's uh, buffering and union and intersect again if you need to do this up on the browser well then this would be a great choice if we're in the back end you know think about letting post just do that you can also interpolate via tins and ISO lines as well and there's more capabilities so if you need to re-examine a topic or need care clarification on a term or concept or just have a question you can get an answer by posting a note on one of the discussion boards for your course. This concludes this lecture.